Where There Is No Doctor, A Village Healthcare Handbook by David Werner. Um, this one, the one I'm holding up here for those of you just uh, just listening, says new revised edition, but this is our book. This is our copy from 1994. It's the second publishing uh, from the second edition, which was in 1992, originally published in 1977 in English, um, which was based on, a, it was a translation from the original in Spanish, Donde No Hay Doctor. I did not know that it was originally in Spanish, but either. apparently according to the frontispiece, the, the front pages of, of this book, it was originally in Spanish. Uh, so again, this this copy of this book is from 1992, and there is apparently a new edition out last year, 2022. I have no idea how it has changed. I assume it has changed somewhat. Uh, it might be worth getting, but um, you know, one of very many reasons to have actual hard copies of books, the text in this, these pages have has not changed. Okay, so. What is this book? Why? Who cares? Where There Is No Doctor, A Village Health Handbook. The back cover says, this book is for the villager who lives far from medical centers. It explains in simple words and drawings what he can do to prevent, recognize, and treat many common sicknesses. This book is for the village storekeeper or pharmacist who sells medicines and healthcare supplies, explains which medicines are most useful, etc. This book is for the teacher in a rural school who will help him give practical advice and care to the sick and injured, etc. This book is for the village health worker, uh, and this book is for mothers and midwives uh, who will find useful the clear, easy to understand information for home birth, care of the mother, and child health. Um, so this, uh, we in the 90s, when we bought this book in, in 94, we were both doing work in, in remote places. And I, in particular, was spending a lot of time in um, very remote places in Madagascar. And I had this book with me in a couple of my longer field seasons. Uh, in Madagascar, where I was living for you know my, my longest field season, one of the only ones that you weren't with me on, uh, for five months on a little island off the coast of Madagascar, living in a tent, showering in a waterfall, occasionally being attacked by lemurs. Uh, and um, and um, and needing to, you know, have, having taken effectively a small pharmacopoeia of, of antibiotics that uh, I'm, I might need and that could, you know, and things like antifungals and, and, and topical antibiotics and such. Um, but also this, this book uh, to, and, and a first aid kit uh, to help with things that, that might happen. And um, this was a really good book to have. From the um, publisher page, we have this description, and you can show my screen just briefly while I read this one paragraph here. The most widely used manual for health workers, educators, and others involved in, involved in primary care and health promotion around the world. Newly updated in March 2022 to include the latest information on burn treatment, family planning, sexually transmitted in infections, epilepsy treatment, vaccination treatment, and preventing malaria and HIV and COVID-19. And uh, one more thing, considered by the World Health Organization to be the most widely used healthcare manual in the world. This classic title is for health workers, clinicians, health educators, midwives, community leaders, and others involved in primary health care delivery and health promotion around the world. Uh, so that's that's the kind of thing that this book is is trying to do, and it really is is an excellent book. Um, and throughout it, oh, one more thing, I'll just read it from my screen. Throughout, there was an emphasis on addressing the underlying causes of poor health and a focus on cleanliness, healthy diet, vaccinations, and an appropriate cautious use of medication, including an examination of helpful and harmful home remedies. So just a little background on this book. Okay. Chapter 12, Prevention, How to Avoid Many Sicknesses. Oh, incidentally, I found in this, um, there's a, a section on rabies, and I found our original, the insert from our rabies vaccinations. <laughs> <laughs> rabies vaccine adsorbed. Uh, anyway, that's that's here. That's interesting. <laughs> All right. I'd be curious to look at that. Yeah, I, I have I have not yet, but here, here we have that. Um, I will say it's been very effective. We have not, not had rabies. Not gotten rabies. Uh-uh, not, not once. Um <clears throat> Okay, prevent, uh, the top of chapter 12, prevention, how to avoid many sicknesses. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If we all took more care to eat well, to keep ourselves, our homes, and our villages clean, and to be sure that our children are vaccinated, we could stop most sicknesses before they start. In chapter 11, we discussed eating well. In this chapter, we talk about cleanliness and vaccination. And they talk a lot about personal hygiene and how to build and where to build uh, latrines and how to maintain them and so that you know so that you don't have you know 
fecal transfer of disease, drinking water, um, not smoking, all of this. And then they also talk about vaccines, as I, as I said. So they've got um, vaccinations, simple, sure protection. Again, this is from 1992. Vaccines give protection against many dangerous diseases. If health workers do not vaccinate in your village, take your children to the nearest health center to be vaccinated. It is better to take them for vaccinations while they are healthy than to take them for treatment when they are sick or dying. Vaccinations are usually given free. The most important vaccines for children are, and they give six, six. DPT for diphtheria, whooping cough, that's pertussis and tetanus, polio, BCG for tuberculosis, measles, not MMR, note, but measles, Interesting. Mm -hmm. tetanus, and smallpox. Now, two of those are not active vaccination um, in the active vaccination schedule anymore, right? Polio and smallpox are not. And measles, the single measles vaccine has been replaced by MMR. Um, I don't know that tetanus may be in the third world, but um, it seems to me that tetanus is usually recommended only after exposure at this point. Maybe, mm, maybe, no? I don't think so. I think they okay. give tetanus and then every 10 years you're supposed to get another. And if you don't know when you got it and you have had a... a then you get an expo a post-exposure thing. Yeah. yeah. And they don't recommend it for um, until, until you're um, an adolescent for this one. Um, so there's... Only six, and then they also have some warnings about vaccines spoil easily, and you know, making sure that um, that if you're either the one delivering it or receiving it, that all of the protocols have been followed. Um, so this is, you know, this is a book uh, that is um, pro vaccine and um, talks explicitly about which ones. Admittedly, a relatively short list uh, that you should, um, especially if you are in the rural developing world, should be sure to be vaccinated against. Now, let me just go back to the beginning here briefly and share with you the chapter titles for the table of contents, if I can figure out without knocking over the zebra where the table of contents is. Where the hell is it? Hold on. Um, it's There's a bunch of front there's pages. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's a very interestingly laid out book, but um, the table of contents is not as easy to find as in some books because there's a lot of other useful information. Okay, just the chapter titles through um, chapter nine. There are many after that. Chapter one, home cures and popular beliefs, in which they talk about home cures and they say that many home cures are far better than what you might get from uh, from a pharmacy, if you even have access to a pharmacy, but also talking about some home cures and beliefs that are likely to cause more harm than good. Chapter two, sicknesses that are often confused. They talk about the difference between non-infectious and infectious diseases. They talk, um, I believe, if I remember correctly, about the differences between, for instance, bacteria and viruses. Chapter three, how to examine a sick person. They go through um, all of the major systems of the body. Chapter four, how to take care of a sick person. Chapter five, healing without medicines, with the sections being healing with water and when water is better than medicines. Chapter six, right and wrong use of modern medicines. Chapter seven, antibiotics, what they are and how to use them. Chapter eight, how to measure and give medicine. And chapter nine, and there are many chapters after this, but this is where I'm gonna stop uh, for the moment, instructions and precautions for injections. Okay, so let's, let's go there to instructions and precautions for injections. Page 65, where they say, again, top of chapter nine, and they've got, uh, you probably can't see it, but they've got a, a syringe right up close there with a question mark through it. They've got a drawing of a syringe with a question mark, which is their indication of like, should you or shouldn't you? Again, I read already um, the part of the book that says, here's the recommended child vaccine vaccination schedule as of 1992. When to inject and when not to. Injections are not needed often. Most sicknesses that require medical treatment can be treated as well or better with medicines taken by mouth. As a general rule, it is more dangerous to inject medicine than to take it by mouth. Injection, injection should be used only when absolutely necessary. Except in emergencies, they should be given only by health workers or persons trained in their use. And then let's just go back a little bit to chapter six, right and wrong uses of modern medicines. And find this. And what they have at the top here is a gun shooting pills. Okay? So they're saying, they've already said, better not to use medicine at all if you can avoid it. Water, good food, rest, all of that is safer than medicine. If you have to have medicine, better a pill than a shot. And a shot is your last resource. Okay. 
Chapter 6, Right and Wrong Uses of Modern Medicines Some medicines sold in pharmacies or village stores can be very useful, but many are of no value. Of the 60,000 medicines sold in most countries, the World Health Organization says that only about 200 are necessary. Remember when the World Health Organization made sense? Mm. Okay, back yeah. to the book. Necessary. Mm. Ivermectin being on that list. Yes, indeed. Also, people some I don't know if it was in 1992, though. Trying it was discovered in the early 80s. I don't know yeah. if it was on the who's yeah. list of essential yeah. medicines in 1992 or not. Back to the reading from the, the book again, uh, where there is no doctor. Also, people sometimes use the best medicines in the wrong way, so that they do more harm than good. To be helpful, medicine must be used correctly. Many people, including most doctors and health workers, prescribe far more medicines than are needed, and by so doing, cause much needless sickness and death. Are you listening, FDA? <laughs> There is some danger in the use of any medicine. Some medicines are much more dangerous than others. Unfortunately, people sometimes use very dangerous medicines for mild sicknesses. I have seen a baby die because his mother gave him a dangerous medicine, chloramphenicol, for a cold. Never use a dangerous medicine for a mild illness. Remember, medicines can kill. This is careful, nuanced, Reasonable medical advice aimed at a population who would not necessarily have access to what was considered the most up-to-date and most high-tech medicine available to those of us in what we then called the developed world. No, oh, what we then called the first world. Now we would call it the developed world, as opposed to the developing world. That is the sanest thing I have heard from anything official purporting to give health advice at a wide level in any sort of a mainstream format since about this time. Like where, and I, you know, I think we will get, I'll, I'll order the 2022 book and see if it still makes sense. And I don't know if it will or not, but it cites the who favorably. And the WHO cites this book on the publisher's site favorably as providing the skills and the information necessary for people to take their own health into their own hands. This is what we need. I would love to know. Uh, I have the sense that um, this book would be de facto sacrilege in a modern medical context because modern yeah. medicine has become so pill happy. Yeah. Um, but I'd be interested to know what, what doctors would think, how inconsistent this is with the training that they receive, which does make them overly aggressive uh, with treatments. It makes them uh, underrate the danger of iatrogenic harm. Yep. Um, iatrogenic harm, which should probably be dichotomized. There's iatrogenic harm that comes because somebody did the right thing for you and, you know, you got unlucky. And then there's iatrogenic harm that is completely avoidable, that is the result of bad drug combinations or wrong drug prescribed or, uh, you know, you put on a ventilator when you shouldn't have been. I guess there might be a third category. Maybe this isn't considered iatrogenic, but... Uh... You know, just just the fact of being in a hospital puts you at greater risk for contract for getting something like MRSA. Yeah. Right. Um, and I guess I I feel like that should be under the rubric of iatrogenic harm, but I'm not sure that it that it falls there. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Um, but the amount of iatrogenic harm, even if that's excluded, is so large yeah. um, that anyway, there's a very different conversation we should be having, and it should be a conversation that is taken as baseline when we get to the question of, you know, a one-size-fits-all public health prescription for a pandemic, for example, right? What are the chances that this is going to result in a massive iatrogenic crisis um, that we don't see coming because that's the nature of them? Um, we never had that discussion. No, no, we don't. Um, and there's, you know, I... <clears throat> Those parts of the book that I just shared were mostly not parts that I had been familiar with before because uh, I, you know, we had been vaccinated against rabies and yellow fever and a few other you know, tropical diseases that seemed important to be vaccinated against. Given where uh, you and I are both working, I took with me 
courses of antibiotics, you know, one of which almost certainly contributed to me rupturing my Achilles tendon, you know, decades later, yep. uh, the, the Cipro, the, um, something floxamine, I can't remember the class of ciprofloxin. Yeah. But no, but the class of oh, drugs, um, to which it belongs, uh, are known now to, uh, cause to put, uh, soft tissue, specifically, uh, ligament and tendons at risk, um, both in the moment while you're on them and, uh, long-term, the more, the more you've been on them. Uh, but, you know, I would I would do some research in advance and take with me what seemed um, to be most likely to be protective against the things I was most likely to run into and be very sparing uh, uh, in in taking those things. But you know, mostly this book was about um, you know what to do in case of uh, you know extremely urgent problems like you've broken something. Yep. Uh, or you need, you know, you need to, you know, so, someone, someone near you is experiencing something, and you need to figure out like what things you can do that are going to maximize them surviving, uh, and you not doing damage to them as you try to help. Uh, and so, you know, having having such a book in one's in one's personal library that you're in the field with is incredibly useful. And yet, I feel like now, I'm so grateful to have it in our library here in the United States. Right. And I think that most Americans should have both such such a book and also the expertise that they glean from reading such a book. Because increasingly the the caution about medication represented in this book is the opposite of what you're going to get if you actually go to someone who is paid to help you stay or get healthy. And um, that's that seems to be just like the FDA is doing the opposite of what I believe it is supposed to be doing. It seems to me that the entire medical profession, and therefore most of the people who are medical professionals, are doing the opposite of what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, but we're living in an era where we have uh, near universal violations of the Nuremberg Code and Hippocratic Oath. Yes. That's an era in which you need a book for, uh, you know, what happens if your doctor is captured by pharma. <laughs> yeah, there's no chat. Yeah, there's, <laughs> uh, that's not, there's no, no chapter on that. This is too early, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, there's information on testing for glaucoma, infection of the tear sac. Uh, yeah, you know, a lot. Just so what to do with allergic reactions, you know, asthma, tapeworm. But so good. Yeah. So good. And um, yeah, uh, get a copy. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe uh, I'll get the 2022 version and uh, do a quick perusal and see how it compares. Good. And, and come back with that 